Welcome to the Cyber Rants Podcast, where we're all about sharing the forbidden secrets and slightly embellished truths about corporate cybersecurity programs. We're ranting, we're raving, and we're telling you the stuff that nobody talks about on their fancy website and trade show giveaways, all to protect you from cyber criminals. And now, here's your hosts, Mike Rotondo, Zach Fuller, and Lauro Chavez. Hello, and welcome to the Cyber Ants Podcast. This is your co-host, Zach Fuller, joined by Mike Rotondo and Lauro Chavez. Um, we have an episode today that's a little bit different, taking a little uh, changing gears here. Uh, today, we're essentially talking about us. We're talking about what is Silent Sector, who is Silent Sector, which is, of course, the firm behind Cyber Ants, right, as the partners we wrote the Cyber Ants book, um, do the podcast and all that. But there's a cybersecurity firm behind us where we spend the vast, vast majority of our time. And so we wanted to talk about that today, not to be self-serving. I mean, you know, of course we we think everybody should know how awesome we are, but really that's not what it's about. It's about those people that are looking to get to know us a little bit better, um, looking at uh, opportunities for um, bringing in a partner that can really help them uh, accelerate the growth of their security program and um, help them uh, tackle compliance requirements and do that type of work. So that's what today is about. But before we do that, Mike, why don't you kick us off with the news? Good morning and uh, welcome to our 120 minute sales speech. I'm sorry, we're gonna keep it short, just kidding. The new Android malware gets full control of your phone to steal passwords and info. There's a new Android malware called Tanglebot. Basically what it does is a malware that's spread via text messages with the aim of luring victims into clicking a malicious link and inadvertently allowing cyber criminals to gain full control over the device to steal personal information and bank details. Basically it's a key logger. Uh, it would also allow you to uh, allow you allow them to take over your camera and microphone. So, uh, you know, be careful what you do with your phone. Or get an iPhone, please. Yeah, yeah. Until they figure out how to hack that one. 150 million Google user accounts will automatically be enrolled into 2FA. Uh, Big Brother Google has decided that everybody's going to go on 2FA, and so sometime in the next couple months, they will be enrolling an additional 150 million Google users into Google's 2SV. Uh, and 2 million YouTuber creators to turn it on as well. Everybody's using 2FA pretty soon. Uh, you know, I got mixed feelings on this. I, I, I like 2FA. I don't like someone telling you you have to use it. That's a free application. Anyway, telco service provider Giant Cineverse has had unauthorized access since 2016. Uh, Cineverse is a service provider discloses a security breach. Threat actors have had access to its database since 2016 and gained some customers' credentials. It's basically a large telco provider and somehow someone has been in there persistently. It stole data of about 235 of its customers. Um, so. I thought it was Cinnabon's sister company. Yes, no. <laughs> no, no. Cineverse? Cineverse. Um, hey, guess what? There's a Windows issue. A uh, new UFI, UEFI no. bootkit used to backdoor Windows devices since 2012. A newly discovered and previously undocumented, unidentified, unified extensible firmware interface, UEFI, bootkit has been used to, by attackers to backdoor Windows systems by hijacking the Windows boot manager since 2012. I'm so glad they're on the uh, Council for Security for the Country. Um, new Python ransomware targets virtual machines, ESXi, hypervisors to encrypt this. This is pretty interesting. It's a new strain of Python-based malware that has been used in a sniper campaign to achieve encryption on corporate systems in less than three hours. Um, the attack is one of the fastest recorded by Sophos Research and was achieved by operators who used precision targeted the ESXi platform in order to encrypt the virtual machines of the victim. Um, so basically they attack team viewer and they go from there. Um, lastly, I'm just going to give you a couple of headlines that you do need to be aware of, especially if you work with the federal government, new U S government initiative holds contractors accountable for cybersecurity. Uh, long story short, feds are going to start looking at what you're doing. Um, I think the days of you doing what you want to do and saying, oops, we got screwed up, uh, are over. You need to tighten that stuff up. A ransomware law would require victims to disclose ransom payments within 48 hours. This is another government initiative. And then the new cybersecurity regulations are released by the TSA for trains and planes. Also something to be aware of if you're involved with security for trains and planes. Um, so those are three new things from the government. We have some other things like the Facebook flaw and the Twitch data breach issue. And there's another Microsoft bug fix. And there's 
an Apache fix and a couple other things that we we're going to post with the podcast. But that's it for the headlines today, Laurel. Thanks, Mike. Good stuff there. You know, um, that uh, that bot that's sending the, the text messages to all the phone via SMS has been around for a long time. You know, I, I, I get those probably about two or three times a week, just in case my uh, my uh, would-be assassins out there listening to this. Yeah, I, I get those text messages and I click on them too. It's a funny <laughs> thing. Nothing's happened yet, but um, I don't really check that phone often. I have a glass bottom cat box and that's where I keep <laughs> that phone. And so I, I don't know really what 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 they're seeing or getting on that but anytime i get those messages i'm, I'm really really happy to click on them um, <laughs> especially with that phone so <laughs> that being said awesome yeah no in the, in the twitch hack good info too i think the the worst of that really is the is the fact that um those some of those streamers are making an incredible amount of money bad bad on on the configuration change but um for exploitation let's talk about that um leading on the the twitch situation right that what 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 we're hearing is that there was a server server configuration change that allowed, that allowed some massive vulnerability. So um, th this, you know, kind of hopefully dovetails on this. And yes, our good friend WordPress is back in the news uh, for exploitation this week. And the only reason that I really wanted to bring it up is because of the WordPress plugin that it actually is. Okay, so all of you WordPress heads out here ready for this. The Bulletproof Security Plugin 5.1 has a sensitive information disclosure. Uh, the alias path to the um, admin DB backup log can be obtained externally with no permissions at all. So if you're using WordPress and you thought that you uh, would install the Bulletproof Security plugin to help you, well, I would, um, yeah, well, anyways, so take a look at that. And the one I really want to talk about is uh, the Apache 2.4.49 path reversal and remote code execution. This was a zero day. Um, there's some POCs out there, and I have just really got to give um, just a lot of credit to the Luca Souza here for posting this POC, and it's a very simple bash shell uh, script that you can write. It's it's less than 15 lines to execute if CGI is running. Um, you can get the Etsy password file uh, right from the server, so it's a pretty interesting POC that they've got. So. All of you running um, Apache out there, make sure that you've paid attention to that zero day and you're awaiting the patch. We've got some form of compensation in place. If it's internal, less of a threat, but um, make sure you get that looked at. That is all I have for exploits today. Zach, what are we what are we talking about again? Marvel Comics this time, right? Yep, I think time? that's part it's of this it. Episode. That's part of it. No, uh, you know, in essence, we're we're talking about the cybersecurity firm that is Silent Sector. So people that are out there. Um, out there in the wild looking for help can understand what um, a cybersecurity firm is, does, um, should do, uh, of course. Um, and before we dive into that, in fact, we're going to skip the commercial today because in essence, you could, you could call this whole episode a commercial, but it's really to give you an idea. Um, those listeners that are listening to this stuff over and over, I think we have, I think, are we up to 50, 60 million listeners now? Is it something like that? Um, but uh, maybe not quite. Maybe my numbers are a little off, but I want to make yeah. sure that people understand, you know, hey, here's the thought process that goes into um, a cybersecurity firm building one, what, you know, what are, you know, kind of core beliefs and that thing. Now, that said, doesn't mean ours match up with everybody else. I think quite the contrary, but that's what we're talking about today. Fair enough? Uh, Fair enough. I, I did think Sounds we good. did some fan mail from Papua New, New Guinea. Uh, talking oh, you, about how they love the, the podcast. You did? Oh, you okay? Okay. Yeah. Do you want to read that, or is it what language? Uh, it, it was actually my mom. She was there. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Good. Well, good to good to hear. Say <laughs> say hi to your mom. Well, uh, <laughs> hey, at least we have Andy. global reach, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, well, well, good. Um, hi, mom. Hi, Mike's mom. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Uh, Thanks for being our only fan. It means a lot. Uh, it really does. Yeah, but but seriously, to the other, um, you know, five people, almost five, almost five million, fifty million, whatever it is today. But let's talk about. Uh, well, first, let's just get there. I'm just going to create the mechanics really quick, right? Just kind of the the common. So, what um, what is Silent Sector? So, we are a cybersecurity services firm that protects mid-market and emerging size organizations. Most of our customers are um, B2B technology companies like software as a service companies, um, system integrators, 
um, different platforms um, like uh, med tech, ed tech, fintech, defense tech, all the techs, right? And then um, aside from that, we also uh, do quite a bit of work with financial services companies um, from banks and credit unions to insurance, um, to private equity firms, you name it. Um, and then uh, also healthcare. So I'd say those are our main verticals. We've certainly done work with uh, others, manufacturing and fiduciary firms, things like that, kind of um, uh, other types of industries. But we see a lot in those industries that are heavily compliance regulated. Um, mechanics wise, what else? And none of this is scripted, by the way. We're just we're just kind of ranting today. Yeah, I was um, going to say education. Ask, you could have you could have thrown education in there too. I, I didn't know if I heard that, but yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Education. I'm sorry. Ed Ed Tech Ed Tech the education. Yeah. Um, oh, I thought technology we were talking about companies. Ed, my bad. <laughs> no, so we're we're um, we started in 2016, uh, 2017. We took on a couple clients that year, but really 2017 was um, when we went went in and really started doing outreach and stuff and has have really grown um, significantly, but steadily, you know, grown the right way since then. Um, and mm -hmm. we are, we function in a couple different ways. So we do, uh, we'll, we'll be a, essentially a remote security department um, for companies that we serve. We'll, we'll become an extension of their organization. We'll build cybersecurity programs end to end. We, you know, everything from risk assessments and pen testing to, all the governance and compliance work, policy documentation, staff awareness training, um, representing the companies as their information security officers, their clients, that sort of thing. So we do that. And then we also do individual projects, right? So um, lots of penetration testing, lots of risk assessments, um, uh, blocks of consulting time, things like that. So um, that's who we are in a nutshell. Um, obviously, check out our website for more information, silentsector.com. But enough of that. Let's talk about the why. Right? We got to look at the why. So um, be fun to just chat about why we started Silent Sector. I mean, what are, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Well, <laughs> um, I don't know, Mike. I mean, you, you know, I, I don't know. I, I guess I'll, I'll say it first. I, I I really wanted to, I, it's kind of, I guess it's hard to get to the root core of why I was really invested in, in well, what we were doing today. I think what it comes down to, Laura, let me help you out. We're smarter than everybody else and we figured out. <laughs> we, uh, so, I didn't uh, want to say it like that, but we were, we were heavily suppressed. Okay, you guys so are I'm so not... smart. <laughs> <laughs> you just like just so, so it's all smart. The, it's all the nanobots activated in my body. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, put... I, <laughs> put Einstein to shame, you guys. No, I mean, just oh, he would be gosh. embarrassed if he was on this call right now. <laughs> well, he might be. He might not know how to like take images or do like a selfie or anything like that. But I'm <laughs> sure when it came to physics, okay, no, but seriously, uh, my, you know, my, I know I'm not speaking for my let Mike go, but you know, we we all come from corporate, um, corporate security teams, and you know, different at different levels and, and even leadership levels. And, and what you, we, I mean, this is the constant struggle that I think everybody who listens to this podcast, or at least the majority of them, probably feel that, that, you know, you, you, you understand what needs to be done, but there's corporate politics in the way that, that won't get it done. And so what, what would happen to me essentially was, was, you know, I would, I would bring forth these architectural diagrams and, and very clear data to show how to, how to not, not only be more efficient, but be more secure with a defense and depth strategy, right? If we changed things on simple servers and, and applications that were being used at the, at the business that I was, um, I'll, I'll refer to, won't refer to by name. They're, they're not worthy of that on this podcast yeah. with all these listeners. But I was met with, you know, suppression, like, no, we're not doing that. You know, that's not, that's not one of the, you know, the, the, the tiered goals or we've got this year to, you know, update or whatever. And so what would happen is we'd have a third party audit come in, thank goodness. And this auditor would come in and they would see the same problems that we saw in cybersecurity, same problem I saw. And they would structure the same type of data evidence and present that to leadership and leadership would go, all right, yeah, that's, let's fix this. We're going to fix this. And so what I, what I realized really quickly was that, you know, despite data presentation at times, right, regardless, now it's, it's probably a lot better now when, when Mike and I were, were doing this, it was probably more prevalent. Um, cybersecurity is just a, a de facto standard now, it seems like, but at our time it was, you know, it was a, it was a budget squeeze. And so we had to fight there were always ways. You had to fight for it, right? And even if you had accurate data, it was still like, you can't get it from that. 
And we're like, but yeah, we, we proved it in proof of concept. Yeah, it can't happen. It's not going to happen this year. So we just got frustrated. I got frustrated with that. And I thought, you know, I need to be one of those consultants that comes in and says the same thing. And it actually makes the difference that I'm looking to make. I didn't want to make a buck. I mean, that's, you know, why we, a, a byproduct of, of why, you know, we practice this craft. But I practice this craft because I truly believe that we can all be more secure together and that there are very simple changes that all organizations can make to prevent some of the atrocities we see today. Like, don't use windows. I mean, it's pretty much just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'll, I'll stop there, Mike. I mean, that's you just really converted my everybody. <laughs> that's my core reason, right? Is that I, I want to make a difference. And I was not being able to do that at the places that I was at. And, and, meeting these two wonderful individuals allowed me to to help these companies yeah i mean i i got tired of fighting the battle too i mean they get to the point where you know when you're in 38 meetings in a 40-hour week and you're saying the same thing over and over again and some vp of sales comes in and overrides you because he read uh you know an article in the back of in-flight magazine about how wonderful this new technology is yeah. you know we mm -hmm. need to implement it and or you know the that you know, really happened, by the way. He's not he's not making stuff up. This yeah, no, real, no. Yeah. These are real references. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, or, you know, this Fortune was a 500, 100 company we were working with that decided the entire company was going to be PCI compliant, even though they couldn't function uh, in the base. I mean, they are very good at development and, and their product, but so much of what they did was just uncomfortable. And, you know, yeah. when you take deprecated systems out of scope for PCI that have no PCI data because you don't want to fail the audit, you, you run into an ethical issue as well. And, and that really started to chafe on me because I really got tired of, you know, someone overriding me and having to write a statement and being the thorn in everybody's side and saying, this isn't right. We can't do it this way. This is not ethical. This is not right. And changing jobs every 18 months or so because I just couldn't tolerate it. At the end of the day, I got to be able to, you know, go to bed at night and sleep, you know. Um, and frankly, I, I saw what, you know, the spinning the wheels and the big corporate environments got us nowhere. And I thought, you know, I was talking to these guys and we were like, well, let's target the small to medium companies who the big guys ignore, but still Always. have headaches. Yeah. And, 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 and mean more. Yeah. And mean more in the economy, honestly. Right. Right. Yeah, and, and, you know, we can impact so many more people by focusing on the medium to emerging business or whatever our correct terminology is, or small to medium or whatever it is. And by focusing on those people and providing the level of expertise that we have and calling on our network of engineers that we know that we can bring in all of this expertise, we, we can make a better, we can make um, you know, the country in America more secure that way and, and secure more people. And, you know, we've, we've really benefited a lot of small companies that way, um, getting them situated to get big deals and, um, you know, those sort of things and um, getting yeah. that acquired and yeah. Yeah. Just, nobody else is going to do it. I mean, you know, it, I don't know. It's how I felt, right. Nobody else is going to do, no one else is going to secure these small medium sized businesses. No right. one cared about them, but, We've, you know, we've been in, under attack as a nation, as as an as an economic machine for over for two decades, probably. Yeah, you know, yeah. from from cyber uh, related espionage and attack, and and it's all targeted. You know, the, the large companies, yes, they're they're the ones you know about, but they're not the ones that make the machine work, in America. They're just not. Okay, there's lots of other organizations, and and those are really what's important, and they're just being overlooked. You know, yeah, yeah it's um, used to be that, yeah, it's really the Fortune 500s get the service from the cybersecurity firms and the and everybody smaller, like the mid market that we work with a lot. That it's um, they're just, you know, if if they're not willing to write a fifty thousand dollar check just to talk to somebody, they're not getting any attention. So, um, right. Yeah, yeah I mean, and how can I you mean, and you, how can you be better like that, right? I mean, that's the that's that I think that ethical line that we we had to step on the other side of. It. We're like, look, you can't try to help somebody and then charge them boatloads of money, right, you know, right. to do so, right? I mean, you have to be able to you have to be able to work with the individual client, every every one of the 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 individuals and the organizations we represent have different challenges financially and and 
um, you know, from a from a big, you know, kind of big picture, big play uh, business uh, situation too. So we, we have to very carefully you navigate that with them because not not because we're looking for a but because we care, we want to, right? It's hard. It's harder to do that than it is to just be like, oh, you can't write us a fifty thousand dollars check. Cool, we'll go someplace else. Yeah, yeah. Just to just to open the conversation, I'm I'm getting. Do you guys do either of you have a tissue? I'm getting a little little choked yeah. up here. Um, yeah, stop it. Hearing about let me the, slap, the let me slap the, you at the difference difference you want to make in the world and uh, no, but that's that's hey, don't really make fun what of my is, feelings. You know? Are you poking fun at our feelings? That's I'm just not, not nice. No, <laughs> no, no I appreciate here. that. It's, it's uh the no, it's, that's really the truth, though. I mean, that's why Silent Sector was for I me. Mean, my I've I've been an entrepreneur my whole life, uh, other than uh, some time in the army, and and uh, love building businesses, right? Love um, building building companies that that can uh, operate in a in a certain level of excellence, right? Not just kind of your your mass produce approach or one size fits all approach, but um, it's really been a lot of fun, and and I think this, um, in, in you know, in the military, I got to work overseas and really it, it do some some things to protect um, the United States, and that was very meaningful, right, at the time. And I think for me, it was well, cybersecurity. There's a tremendous need here. There's no doubt that our nation, the backbone of our nation's economy, is under attack by the enemy. That's those mid market and emerging size companies. And we have to do something. So the fact that we can build a business out of that, protect good people from behind the scenes, you know, kind of kind of working in the shadows, so to speak. But um, it's not it's not always about, you know, the next sale and, the you know, really, really uh, all of that for us. Right. We're not selling a marketing tool or sales product or anything like that. We are. Um, but we are absolutely um, an enabler. For these companies, I mean, your clients have landed millions in revenue in new contracts because they had effective cybersecurity programs in place and put that front and center in the sales process. Showed that they were a lower risk option than the competition out there, um, and that's been that's been ver that's been really meaningful, I think. So that's that's been uh, it's been an awesome adventure in being able to shape the organization to serve a different. Uh, demographic that really needs it, and and then actually see our initiatives go through, right? Rather than working on something for years for corporate and then just having it pushed aside because um, it's checked enough blocks or whatever. So, yeah, we were awesome. we were pedaling for the wrong machines. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> on the big exercise, and I, I, you know the the interesting thing too is all the people that on our team. That most of them, it's the same situation, right? Everybody wants kind of a uh, not only a better lifestyle and better environment to work, but also one where their skill set is is it's blatantly obvious that it's making an impact, right? Unlike a lot of the a lot of the work that gets done in the corporate world. So that's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. And for those people that don't know, our cause for silent sector, the, the, the reason we're here is really to protect the backbone of our nation's economy and way of life. That is our, our purpose for being uh, as, a, as an organization. So that is, again, those, those mid-market and, and smaller companies. And the way we do that is, is building exceptional cybersecurity programs, you know, want robust, um, right size for the organizations they're built, uh, built for and sustainable. So yeah, we're. Uh, I'd I'm, say I'm we have a to... conviction. Oh, well, that's what the show's about. I, think, <laughs> I guess that's okay. yeah, that's the title of the <laughs> podcast, right? I guess it's okay. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I'd say we had a. I'd say we have a conviction for doing that, right? I mean, I think all of us are believers in that this makes a difference, and we've seen it make a difference, right? And that that I think that it's like seeing that work come to fruition and and watching these organizations accelerate and and still be you know, under the guise of, of a, a framework and, and practices that, that protect the data that belong to all of us, right? And including that company. Well, I Let's think, talk. On, on all honesty, you know, we're, we could very easily, if we weren't the people that we are, sit in, in a large corporate environment and cruise along, doing the minimum, playing the game, having zero risk, making, you know, six figures with our bonus and our vacations and our sick days and our 401ks, as opposed to taking the risk that we've taken to go ahead and work with these small companies. Oh, totally, man. And you know what? It's it's funny you say that because um, 
that that life of comfort was so easy you know what i mean yeah. and, and it's so easy to sum and and I don't, I don't want to get poetic or whatever, but I think those, those of us who've joined the silent sector team, we hunger for more, um, yeah. more productivity, um, more conviction in our work. And, and I think more desire to see it, to see it come to, to the fruition in the places that mean the most to, to the way of life that we have here and that we enjoy. Creates more so much in attack and penetrate. <laughs> yeah. With Bill, Bill Lumberg is your boss, exactly. but, uh, yeah, it, you know, this this environment too, it, it forces growth, right? We don't, you can't just sit there in in the same cube day in and day out, um, pulling the same levers. You are always having to expand, always having to grow um, in, in lots of different areas, which is which is really cool. Keeps it interesting. And, you, you know, I mean, you can always go back to a, a you know, corporate gig, certainly with the skill sets are there and the, the, the you know, recruiters are vicious out there, but um, they're, you know, they're, there's, again, not a, not a lot of meeting. There's a, there's a reason that people leave that, that environment and, and go work with um, uh, smaller firms, right? Uh, make more of an impact. But let's talk about how that manifests in the different services, kind of what, what the, why the services differ. And I'll just start with, um, there's a big, there's a lot of snake oil out there in the market, right? And the cybersecurity industry has created a, a gold rush, so to speak. And so new products and things are, are popping up every minute. There's something new out there, the latest, greatest widget or tool that's going to solve all your problems. But I don't think that's really how it works. Well, there's, so, <laughs> there's so much VC money out there chasing the next best. You know, they're looking for the next Slack. They're looking for the next, you know, whatever. Yeah, that you're getting all these things pop up and yeah, the Arctic Wolf, the Fire Eye, like these big, big stories about big exits and different things. It's um, I it's appealing. So I understand from a business perspective why people go after that, um, but I think it's flooding the market with a lot. We focus on first working with the technologies or companies already have yeah and, and let me let me stop let me stop you there zach because um for the listeners out there i mean that's our number one thing right i can i can almost guarantee every client that we've seen and we will see is not using the technologies that they have today to 100 percent efficiency yeah they're just not they're just yeah. not and and so yeah sorry sorry to cut you off zach <laughs> i know you were going to dovetail it into that right that we we try to use what you have already because we know as engineers for a fact that you're not using 100% efficiency on your on your the tools that you have yeah. and some of some of the research that we've done is showing like you're using about 18% of the capability of the tools that you have natively installed to do cybersecurity related tasks 18% so the next time someone comes in and says we need this new widget i want you to think about what you have today what you're spending on it today and how well you're using it i'm well, sorry exactly go ahead there's a whole section in the book on that about tools and that that was kind of stemmed from a couple different experiences and one of them was that we went into a company and they had this great software suite in beta and it had been in beta for five years they never installed the production version and they'd been paying for it the entire time yeah big bucks too big bucks yeah, we're talking yeah, and millions millions so we transitioned them over to that and got rid of ancillary tools that they had gotten for the same functionality that this thing, I mean, basically the guy that had set it all up left the company and they just kind of, no one bothered to say, hey, you know, you need to stop paying for this or you need to build it. They just left it, which also it, leaves a hole in your environment because you don't, if that thing's not patched, you don't know what connections are out there. You have, I mean, other concerns as well. Yeah, totally. And, and that's, I mean, I can echo that experience too. You know, we had, a, we had a, a, you know, another client that, you know, they had, they had a, a good tool they were using for endpoint protection. Yeah. It was working. We'd proven it in pen test after pen test and, and POC with thumb drives and all the stuff, right? That it was good. Well, they had a new uh, individual come in and decided that they didn't like that for whatever reason. And they wanted this new thing put in. Well, then they get, you know, they get all the money and they get the okay to put all this new thing in. And then that individual really turns out that they're using that as just a leap for their career. And then that person leaves. And now the organization is kind of left hanging because they had a, a one individual expertise, right? So it's kind of, yeah. it's not, you can't really point the finger here, really. You know, I don't want to try to get into that, but it, it creates a problem for the organizations, right? You know, and um, 
that, that's that's hard to stomach sometimes and and i hear that i hear that that we hear that story a lot right that they've got oh, yeah. this and this and it's you know redundant capability sort of thing for for those yeah. people that don't know the marketplace too it's important so just to to kind of um summarize all that so the typical model of a mssp or managed security service provider the typical model industry is to sell products and then you have a kind of a, a service package on the back end of that right so you sell a product you get a markup from that and then you get a retainer on an ongoing basis kind of make it sticky right so you might sell a sim solution and then you got a sock with people doing eyes on glass right and they're paying for that service um, over and over. So, so oftentimes people go to like an MSSP or something, which, and there's absolutely time and a place and there's reasons for that, right. To, for certain tools and solutions and stuff. So it's not that they're not that they're bad, but a lot of times they go, okay, well, um, you know, we, we know we need to be secure. Where do we start? And they say, oh, well, you need all these products, plug all this stuff in and pay for it. Whereas we take the approach of actually building a formalized risk management program, starting strategically, looking at the tools and technologies you already have, and then getting in and providing the hands-on support um, to actually do the implementation, um, implement controls uh, in alignment with industry-recognized frameworks like NIST CSF, CIS controls, you know, it doesn't matter, ISO 27001, they all say 95% of the same thing, but putting in that formalized risk management program first, doing a gap analysis, understanding, okay, if you are in fact short, a technology or there is a tool or solution that is going to make a major impact on your risk management, then yeah, we'll send you some, to some places that sell those types of tools and products and plug it in. And, um, and then, you, you know, take a leap forward with that. But before the plan, the proper planning and, and strategic approach occurs, I mean, it, it's unfortunate, but there's just a lot of people out there slinging product all over the place, yeah. left and right. So the we don't do that. We don't guns. sell product. Yeah, we don't, we don't, we, we're not product resellers or anything. Um, our approach is a bit, bit different. Well, your number one resource is going to be your people. And, and really, tools augment the people you have. You cannot replace people with tools. Yep. You still need the people and you still need to train them. You still need to have someone who functions. And you can only offload so much. Even if you have an MSSSP, you still need a security in-house resource to speak to those people because they can very easily tell you, oh yeah, we got to replace the Johnson rod in your server and your flux capacitor is broken and you don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. Right? Yeah, no, totally. No, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for pulling out. I was ranting too, Zach. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> That's a sore spot for us, right? Because we see that. We see yep. that that product machine gun happen all the time. And yeah. a lot of new CISOs or risk officers or organizations that are trying to, you know, you know, you got to think you've got these you know, you've got these um, small to medium sized businesses, they're doing really good, but now cybersecurity is upon them and they're not quite sure what to do. And so they're in a place, almost like an individual that, that needs car work and you're in a small shop and you don't know about mechanics and you've got Bill Jack Hodo that's gonna, uh, you know, tell you that you need your flux capacitor, you know, in your Chevy fixed or whatever, right? And you're not gonna know, you're just gonna pay them whatever they need because you're stuck. Right. And yeah. and so that's, you know, that's that ethics line that, that we don't like to step over, right? Where there's enough, there's enough uncredible snake oil being peddled that we need to basically be the opposite side of that and sift, sift through it very, very carefully yeah. for the clients. Right. In fact, most of our most of our clients will have either um, an in-house IT team or a in-house, or if they're a development group, you know, software company, they'll have a dev team that's kind of also the de facto IT team. But um, that's very, very common. And then some clients will have small cybersecurity teams, you know, two to five people, that sort of thing, in addition to IT. But usually those organizations, that kind of structure is what we see um, needs the most help, right? Limited limited or no internal security resources um, and just a lot more requirements than they can, they can uh, keep up with when they're handling all the day-to-day, the -day, keep the lights on type operations. And so we, we also uh, have seen another gap in the industry that we, we set out to solve is that it's very, very common. You see virtual so you hear virtual CISO or CISO as a service, that term thrown around a lot. And they're kind of a dime a dozen out there. It's basically um, anybody that's done any kind of risk or governance work in the corporate world kind of comes out and, you know, acts as a consultant and, and stuff. But what, what, these, what we found is that those tend to stop 
at strategy, right? And then they'll and then they'll call in the MSSPs or different third parties or plug-in tools and products, but it's generally very strategic in nature. And what we found is that the mid-market companies that we work with and emerging size companies, they need hands-on support too. They can't just tell them, have somebody give them a, a big list of to-dos and say, good luck, call me next quarter when you need your consultation. Um, you know, that, that approach hasn't been effective. Um, and so a lot of people have transitioned away from that and look for things that, you know, actual hands-on support with real technologists, right? The strategy is great. You need the strategy. You need somebody... Um, guiding you from a CISO type perspective, but um, the the hands-on support needs to be there too to actually get the initiatives done. Very much so, yeah. Yeah, and so if you, yeah, I guess that's the difference is that, you know, you, yeah, you, you're you going to have to have some actionable things done at, at, that are probably going to come out of this gap assessment. And, and I think we're different is that we we have that talent here. You know what I mean? We can we can accommodate pretty pretty much anything that, that we see right that's going to happen at the you know we're not going to we're not going to build new data centers and stuff like that right but you know the the organizations we represent all of the technologies and tools that they need deployed or managed I think that's well within the realm of what's internal to the to the company's talent sector for sure well we're um we're running out of time here i mean i think you know i, I hope this was beneficial for people looking at Cybersecurity companies help you get an understanding of what's out there in the marketplace. Um, we uh, continue to grow um, and and uh, fill the need out there as much as we can, as long as we're doing it the right way, right? So taking the, the right clients that we can really serve, where we're really, really making an impact. Um, and then as far as team building, it's all through, you know, known entities through our network, um, you know, not recruiters and a bunch of third parties, but people that we really know, trust, have worked with in the past. And um, and that's our, our team. And so um, as we grow, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll continue to do episodes. We'll continue to keep you in the loop um, of what's going on. And you can always check out our website um, for some of the different um, unique methodologies and things that we do, you, like check out the risk to revenue.com um, for software companies, our um, methodology we use to transform cyber risk management into a, a revenue generator for companies, um, but a lot of other cool stuff out there on the, the blog website, and of course, through the podcast and book. So that said, that's my rant for today. Uh, you guys have anything else before we jump? Well, I, one of the things that I like about this is that also we get to choose who we work with. Um, just because you show up with money doesn't mean we're going to work with you. And that's been nice to be able to unload some trouble clients from time to time and basically tell people that we we realize that you can't do in the corporate world. I don't want to work with this business owner in, in our world. We can now do that. And it helps because if there's no sense in, you know, we, from our frustration point, we don't want to beat our heads against the wall with someone that's not going to listen. So. Exactly. Or unethical companies that yeah. doctor like risk assessment reports and show that only the best parts to their clients yeah. and not the real, not that that's ever happened, but no, no, never, um, never. But, but yeah, that's, that's, a, that's an excellent point. Um, thanks for throwing that in. And so we, the, the, com the in essence, I mean, the, the companies have to mesh, right? Cause we, we yeah. become a, a partner an extension of the companies we serve almost like we're, you know, we're, it's almost like we're right there, you know, with them day to day. So, um, there's gotta be a good fit. You gotta mesh. So absolutely. Laurel, any, any final comments? No, um, I, <laughs> I hope, I hope that I wasn't too, um, emotional today about the <laughs> you know, coming off the cuff, but yeah, no, I wiped off all my tears. It's, it's okay. It, it was, uh, excellent. And I um, hope this was beneficial for people. Thanks again um, for joining us. If you like the podcast, definitely subscribe and cyberrantspodcast.com. There is a uh, web form that you can um, put in your comments questions, uh, ideas for future episodes, and um, we want to hear from you. So reach out anytime and have a great rest of your day. Pick up your copy of the Cyber Ants book on Amazon today. And if you're looking to take your cybersecurity program to the next level, visit us online at www.silentsector.com. Join us next time for another edition of the Cyber Ants podcast.